from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Diane Vander Raden. I'm the Director of Preservation here at the Library, and I'm very happy to have you join us today for our 56th event in our Topics in Preservation series, uh, which is sponsored by the Preservation Directorate. Today's lecture is actually the first in a new special series that we're doing for TOPS, which will focus on training and communication and funding, all of which are critical and essential to um, the evolution and survival of our field of conservation of cultural heritage materials. So we're very delighted to start this series, and you can see the, the full series here. Uh, again, it's up on our website. Started today with um, Errol Wentworth, who is the Executive Director of the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works, or AIC for short. And she's also the executive director of the foundation uh, for the American Institute for Conservation, um, which we call FAIC. Um, <coughs> Errol has an MA in anthropology and museum training and a background in conservation. For six years, she was actually the director of the Octagon, uh, which is the Museum of the American Architectural Foundation and an 1801 landmark, uh, National Historic Landmark. In 2004, Errol became the executive director of AIC and FAIC following a 20-year career in cultural preservation and the cultural heritage field. Throughout her career, Errol has supported the care of collections, working with conservators on uh, projects and plans for rehousing and treatment and storage and exhibition, and also securing federal and private funds and grants uh, from foundations for preservation and conservation projects. She served on many boards, both national and local, um, for nonprofit organizations. She's been a panelist for NEH uh, for challenge and preservation and access grants, and she's worked with IMLS um, on conservation project support grants. Her presentation today will focus on the overarching goals of FAIC to address needs and trends in our evolving field, and these are based on surveys that FAIC has done and stakeholder meetings in which the Library of Congress was privileged to participate, and we're very grateful for that opportunity. So with that, I'm going to turn the podium over to Errol, and please join me in welcoming her today. Thank I just you, want Diana. to make a special thanks to our um, Associate Librarian of Library of Congress, my boss, Deanna Markham, who's joined us today. We appreciate that. All right, I'll get you. Great. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for coming on this uh, really cold, nasty day, and uh, I appreciate it. And it's a real treat for me to be able to talk about the foundation and what we've been doing over the last several years. When I first interviewed for the executive director's position um, in the fall of 2003, I was told that the board of directors wanted to expand the foundation and its ability to serve the field. Uh, and if hired, part of my charge would be to determine how to best accomplish this. With strong board leadership and the expertise of our members, we're now well on our way, and it's been quite a journey. Yet discussions about the um, uh, priorities of the foundation go back to its very beginning, back in 1973, which seems a long time ago in some ways, but actually we're still a pretty young organization. Um, I find some validation in the fact, though, that um, the original role of FAIC is being continued much as it was envisioned, and in many cases only the means to implement and shape the goals have evolved. Before I go further, I want to acknowledge the funders that made this current strategic planning effort possible. Generous grants from the Getty Foundation and the Institute of Museum and Library Services supported fact-finding through four surveys, and the results of the surveys are up on our uh, website, a series of summits held with a cross-section of leaders in the field of conservation, in allied professions, and foundations. 
and the use of consultants to help guide and inform our work. These grants made it possible for us to focus our staff and our boards on the future of the foundation and have resulted in a strategic plan on which we're hard at work now. We hope to be as successful in realizing our goals as the Library of Congress has been in pursuing its current strategic plan. The Preservation Directorate's collaborative and outreach uh, projects um, resulting from their planning project pro uh, process excuse me, will have a lasting impact on the field. This morning, I'm going to discuss three overarching goals of the new FAIC three-year strategic plan. Each of these goals includes several components. Each looks toward meeting emerging needs in the profession and addressing in some way the changing environment in which conservators are working. New trends, new materials, new technologies. At the same time, each builds on past work of the foundation that we've learned of our, is of value to our members. And we believe that these goals are achievable and make the best use of available resources. The first goal I'll talk about is strengthening the organization and structure of the foundation. Whenever conservators get together, there's sure to be all sorts of fabulous ideas about what could and should be done, and then the resulting question, well, why can't AIC do this? And you know, too often the answer was that we simply didn't have the tools and the resources, the capacity to take on new projects. So it was really essential for us to kind of put it bluntly to, to get our house in order. And that's something that we worked on for a number of years. It's been necessary to provide a structure um, that allowed FAIC uh, to be most, both nimble and efficient. And at the risk of seeing your eyes glaze over, I'm going to talk just a little bit about what that meant for us. Early in my tenure in 2004, I worked with the board to revise the FAIC bylaws. The goal was to more clearly separate the two boards and to structure the foundation board so that it could better serve in a development and outreach capacity. It's important to keep in mind that AIC and FAIC are separate legal entities bound together in the pursuit of, of advancing the field of conservation. While AIC is an association serving professional conservators, FAIC is charged with carrying out charitable, scientific, and educational objectives relating to advancing the knowledge of the field. <clears throat> Historically, the two boards have been the same. When elected to serve on the AIC board, the board member was automatically a member of the FAIC board, and offices of AIC served in the same capacity on the FAIC board, which really wasn't the most effective um, situation for the FAIC board, because um, it's very hard sometimes for board members to switch hats, and the skills that made AIC board members excel often weren't the same skills that were needed to advance the foundation. And over the years, FAIC was overshadowed by AIC with a uh, few institutional resources to support fundraising, outreach, outreach, or a broad-based support of the profession. The current bylaws provide for important overlap between the two boards, yet allow the appointment of members with diverse skills and experience. Currently, there's, there are eight members of the FAIC board, and four are non-conservators. Board cultivation and recruitment is, fo is focusing on those who bring needed expertise, such as art law, for instance, or who can assist in development activities and outreach. We're still in a period of transition, and we're developing new practices and determining the best way for these two boards to work separately, but still be able to support each other in advancing the goals of both organizations. And the work is proceeding, and uh, we're hoping in the coming year to bring on uh, three additional board members. It was only possible to begin this effort at a time when the um, infrastructure was strong enough to support the, such change. With a more interactive website and uh, membership database, we're, we now have the tools to comp continue to improve communication and increase access to information, both internally and externally. Over the past six years, responsibilities have also been restructured, and staff levels have increased from six to 10. And with 10 FTEs, full-time equivalents, four FTEs are devoted to the foundation's work. It's a huge increase from in the past when there was really almost no one. Um, let's see. 
over the, uh, let's see, no. Um, so our activities, of course, in the foundation have increased, as have the activities of this AIC staff members, particularly now that we have a membership of over 3,500. As specified um, by our auditor, we also now have a cooperative agreement in place between the two organizations, and it lays out the financial agreements addressing shared administrative costs and those that are direct billed and uh, split. Overall, we're putting a great deal more time into our financial management efforts, reflecting both stricter IRS requirements, but also the complexities of managing two very active organizations. As a final comment here, I'll just note that we're now creating a development plan for the foundation, our first. And intensive work with a consultant this past fall has really helped us to determine our fundraising priorities and our goals for the coming years. This plan will help guide us in working with AIC members and beyond to broadly promote the field and cultivate donors in upcoming years. The second goal of the strategic plan is expanding and strengthening the core educational purposes of the foundation. Professional education has been a primary focus of the foundation, particularly in the past 10 years. Yet, the first FAIC workshop, Pigment Studies, was held in 1977 in conjunction with a watercolor exhibition co-sponsored by the Foundation and the Fog Art Museum and funded by the National Museum Act Program. When Carolyn Keck became the executive director of FAIC in 1981, she began a series of courses which she, recalled, which she called refreshers. And they, um, the first two were on paper and objects, and they were funded by a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And additional courses followed over the years, typically uh, put together by uh, specialty groups and then supported by the foundation. Over the years, providing training for practicing conservators became increasingly important for, to AIC members. And at the end of 2000, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation gave the foundation its first major endowment of $1.5 million launching our professional development program and enabling the foundation to greatly expand its educational programs. To further support this, the, the Mellon Foundation uh, provided an additional 300000 to support a managerial position. And this uh, critical support resulted in hiring Eric Porcheau, um, who's been instrumental over the years in guiding our educational programs, and now in playing a leading role in the foundation as the institutional advancement director. In 2001, AIC conducted a membership survey on co continuing education needs and created its first strategic plan for professional development. The results of the survey included more than 1,100 suggestions for courses, <laughs> yet the survey didn't really address future trends and directions in the profession as a whole. This was accomplished the following year when the Getty Conservation Institute launched the director's retreats. As a partner in the first retreat, FAIC had the opportunity to meet with leaders in conservation education from across the country and Canada. Um, and they were dis to, to discuss and reflect on current issues in the field. From the retreat, it was determined that the foundation's program would focus on mid-career training, fundraising to develop new courses, and developing partnerships to expand its offerings. The program also needed to remain responsive to membership needs, and AIC has polled its members regularly over the years, and it's gratifying that the professional development program is considered one of our top programs. It owes much of its success to the ongoing support of NEH, which has provided programming grants since 2004, and the Getty Foundation support, uh, supporting curriculum and online development. There's no question that this work will continue as um, a critical role for the foundation, but just what areas are we focusing on? Our research and our experience tells us that the foundation needs to provide programming that address areas of gro uh, growing areas in the field, electronic media, contemporary art, time-based media, and the fact that more and more conservators are working in, in um, preventive conservation. FAIC can assist by providing additional training in these areas and providing literature that conservators can provide to their clients, which I'll talk about shortly. 
I'll mention, too, that we need to encourage collaboration between conservators and scientists, as the Library of Congress is certainly doing. And um, um, FAIC has been encouraged to help foster some of these connections. With the efforts of the Mellon Foundation and many others, the interest of the National Science Foundation um, has been captured, and some NSF funding is coming to the arts. And um, an NSF representative was at one of our strategic planning sessions, which I was really pleased about, which is, and is very important as we continue to build support uh, for conservation. We're also now in discussions with a group from the Netherlands, uh, the Netherlands Organization for Scientific uh, Research, I think, is the uh, primary association there, and to assist in creating and disseminating information about international collaborations between scientists, curators, and conservators. In brief, a strong professional development program will continue as a priority with the support of federal agencies and private foundations and supplemented by the earnings from the professional development endowment, all of which all of these things together help us create new courses, repeat popular ones, and subsidize fees to keep the costs as low as possible. A related need in the field, and one consistently expressed by survey responses, in survey responses, is the importance of providing funding to allow participation in workshops and conferences. Early in the history of the foundation, FAIC scholarships and fellowships were created to meet this need, and the um, George Stout Memorial Fund um, started in 1981 was the first of these. And it was established to support lectures and to assist students in presenting papers at conferences. In 1984, FAIC provided scholarships to eight participants in a two-month workshop in Honolulu. Why aren't we doing those anymore? I don't understand <laughs> that. Uh, Carolyn Keck noted in uh, 1984 that FAIC considers helping our membership to benefit from um, seminars of this caliber is among our priorities. And of course, it continues to be a priority. In 2010, FAIC awarded 66 scholarships and grants, totaling almost $159,000. Yet, the core educational purposes. Um, uh, the core educational role of FAIC goes beyond training and mid-career uh, practicing conservators, uh, beyond training for mid-career practicing conservators. Every discussion and poll has reiterated the importance of maintaining and expanding the allied professional education program, so necessary in increasing understanding and support in museums, libraries, and archives. We will continue to provide online emergency preparedness webinars, for instance, um, and as we're doing now in partnership with AAM. And we'll begin this year uh, to offer a new in-person workshop for um, um, emergency preparedness at National Trust sites as part of our current IMLS grant. In the coming years, we'll see educational uh, partnerships, additional ones being, being added. When talking about outreach for allied professionals and the importance of the work of IMLS, um, the importance of the work of IMLS in partnership with heritage preservation, uh, it, we, it can't be overstated how important connecting to collections is. This multi-year initiative has been invaluable in bringing conservators together with the staffs of small museums and libraries. This initiative has probably reached up to 5,000 collecting institutions across the country and has had broad impact. It has not only helped educate museum staffs about conservation, but has brought them into a one-to-one -one situation with them that is so important for the long-term care of their collections. We were fairly pleased to be a part of this initiative, particularly in helping to organize and present the training programs in uh, the training forum that took place in Buffalo and to be able to survey participants in our quest to learn more about the experiences and perceptions of the staffs of these small organizations in finding and working with conservators. Every recent survey and summit discussion in education, um, summit discussion, in addition to direct messages from members, has told us that there is a tremendous need to disseminate educational information to the public, from serious collectors to those with family treasures. I'll talk more about public outreach as part of the third goal, but I want to touch here on a new component in our strategic plans, which is a public education program. Already we're developing a series of caring for documents 
uh, for collectors and families that are being posted on the website and disseminated through outreach pro programming. Some of these um, documents have been adapted for the Antiques Roadshow's newsletter and for their website and for the 2011 Preservation Week bookmarks. Um, we're also working with Huntington T. Block, and I'm really pleased about this, to develop emergency preparedness brochures for their clients, which include both collecting institutions and um, individual collectors. Yet these projects are just a drop in the bucket when looking at public awareness overall, and we don't have the resources for a large, public, huge public awareness campaign. But what we can do and are doing is pick smaller, manageable programs and making use of the expertise of members to help us. These projects overlap with our third goal, but I do want to just mention one new um, initiative that we're working on, which is our K through 12 initiative. In recent years, we discovered that um, some of, or we discovered recently that in recent years, some of our members have been doing programming on conservation in high schools and, and, and um, uh, in a range of class levels. Um, working with the schools, with students and teachers um, about conservation, the science and the arts. We realized that AIC could help by having our web editor work with these members to develop a web page that addresses how to do this and who can be involved and how you can be involved. And this web page is just going up, maybe today, <laughs> if we're lucky, <laughs> maybe tomorrow. Um, but it will be an interactive web page where people can continue to add to it so people can learn more about how they can reach school children. A final component, component of core educational purposes has been, identif been identified by conservators um, is, is the need to increase conservation literature. We completed, um, FAIC completed its first publication in 1979 with a handbook on mounting techniques for Japanese screens. Uh, other publications have followed uh, sporadic sporadically and with the help of the Samuel, Ace Cre Samuel, excuse me, Samuel H. Cress Foundation, we will print the second edition of the AIC Guide to Digital Photography and Conservation Documentation this year. Yet, of course, the demand for accessible literature is still strong. Since 1994, FAIC has supported the development of manuscripts through the FAIC Samuel H. Cress Conservation Fellowship Scholarship, Public Conservation Publication Fellowships, excuse me. To date, 37 fellowships have been awarded, 26 manuscripts completed, and 18 publications have resulted. This is clearly an important initiative, but FAIC is also exploring options for online publications, print on demand, uh, reprinting out of print publications, all those permutations, and support of new FAIC publications. And we're really um, doing this with the encouragement of the Crest Foundation. The conservation catalogs have already been converted to a wiki format with a grant from NCPTT and are being updated and expanded. And we have at least three other wiki projects in the works. In addition, an agreement is being finalized with Spinach uh, to create a website for their 1992 publication on practical solutions, storage solutions. And, um, and that it will invite updates and, uh, to the original task, text and additional solutions to storage problems. Conservation publications for allied professionals are also in need, and I'm pleased that the publication director at AAM is interested in partnering with us to produce more publications that will help their members uh, care for the collections they have. An AIC article in Environmental Guidelines is coming out in the AAM magazine this month, and we'll be putting up a more technical version of that talk on our website shortly. Discussions are also well underway to publish conservation-related articles in Fine Arts Connoisseur, reaching out again to collectors. In summary, FAIC's educational and grant initiatives have greatly increased in recent years, along with our ability to take advantage of them. And with the help of AIC members, opportunities for new projects and partnerships are being realized. The third goal Finally, the third goal <laughs> the, of the FAIC strategic plan is one that has been a priority expressed for many years by conservators around, from around the world, 
62% of respondents of our recent needs survey identified it as a top priority. And that goal is, of course, to build awareness and advance support of the conservation profession. Every conservator and every collections care specialist has stories of neglect, of lack of funds, and lack of will or awareness that threatens cultural property. Reports such as the Heritage Health Index provide alarming statistics. But just what can FAIC do to help turn the tide, and what resources can we garner, and what initiatives can play a role in raising the profile of conservation? In addition to some of the projects <clears throat> excuse me, that I've already mentioned, I'll briefly review three uh, major projects of the foundation that are and will continue to raise the profile of conservation. I'll begin with Conservation Online Cool, which has been in existence since 1987 with the um, commitment of the Stanford University Libraries and, of course, Walter Henry. When Stanford determined in 2009 that it could no longer support Cool, Cries of alarm sounded from over 90 countries around the world, and FAI ste FAIC stepped in within days to assume responsibility for COOL. See, we are nimble. We can be nimble. Uh, first, COOL and its disk list, disk list were stabilized <coughs> excuse me, on a new server. And then, with the help of the Getty Conservation Institute and the Library of Congress, we held an international meeting of stakeholders in COOL to share ideas about maintaining and improving COOL in the future. In late 2009, we sent out a survey to DISLIST subscribers, and there are over 10,000 DISLIST subscribers from around the world, to assess what their needs and, and perceptions, expectations were. <clears throat> and then the results of this survey can be found on our website. All indications are that the current users of the disk list are mostly satisfied with its plain text format and uh, with the frequency in which it comes out. And we're not planning on doing anything significant to change the disk list at this point. Yet, suggestions for improvements to the COOL website, used by far fewer number than the disk list, uh, were many, and therein lies some potential for us. Uh, recently, we've put together a small working group, and it was created to begin to map the architecture of the site and to articulate the optimal experience for the cool user, including efficient navigation and search features and up-to-date content. This was done so that we could begin to draft a narrative for potential vendors. We needed specialists, or we need specialists, who can help us determine the best way to take what we have now, which is pretty valuable, and transform it into something new. And, and we also needed cost estimates. Our goal is to develop a, um, a planning grant and then and determine, and that will help us determine how to transform COOL, and then we can uh, submit a, an implementation grant proposal. The vision is to become the go-to conservation resource by increasing current content and linking to appropriate content on other sites. We're not going to try to reinvent any wheels. It's exciting to contemplate all that COOL can do for the field, but what we must also ensure is that we have a means of sustainable support for COOL, and that's why a, valuable, a viable multi-year business plan is an essential piece of this uh, complex project. Another component of our third goal calls on us to develop models for best practices, initiatives, and in conservation and to create model programs. These models might build on AIC white papers or on FAIC workshops or on grant-funded projects to address topics that are most in need in, um, in collecting institutions. In 2009, FAIC was invited by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to submit a proposal for the Hermitage Photograph Conservation Initiative, a program that had grown out of previous Mellon-supported surveys of the Hermitage Photograph Collection. I should say collections. There were many throughout the museum. The Mellon Foundation looked to FAIC as a trusted partner based on our track record of solid financial management, respected professional development program, and long-term commitment to supporting conservation um, activities worldwide. We're, of course, delighted um, that FAIC is seen as a trusted resource in advancing um, initiatives internationally. 
With Mellon support secured, FAIC launched a four-year initiative in 2010 to establish a photograph conservation department at the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. Training in photograph conservation, collections care, documentation, cataloging, digital imaging, and scientific research is being conducted in Russia and in France and in the United States. The Hermitage Grant covers all project expenses and has direct financial benefits to FAIC, but of lasting importance is the development of conservation online resources to support the documentation of this project, to support images and foreign language resources. This will serve as an example for best practices in photograph conservation, cataloging, and digital imaging, and will provide a long-term resource for the preservation community. This initiative represents a significant expans expansion of FAIC's ongoing programs and its continuing effort to engage and educate conservators in the United States and internationally. The final component of the FAIC um, strategic plan is, to dis is um, AIC CERT. In 2000, well before Katrina hit our coast, FAIC received funding from NEH for our first emergency response train the trainer program. But the need for ongoing support of specially trained responders became imminently clear with the devastation resulting from Hurricane Katrina in 2005. We spent hours and hours on the phone and with meetings with the staff of other uh, responding organizations from across the country to share information about losses and responses and to lament that our efforts were not better coordinated. We were simply not prepared, no one was, for a disaster of this scale. During the Katrina response, we began to outline what particular strengths we, AIC and AIF, could bring to a more organized response in the United States. With funding from IMLS in 2006, FAIC trained 64 collection emergency responders, supplied them each with go packs and identity cards, and instituted a 24-hour emergency phone line manned by volunteer AIC CERT members. In 2008, six teams were deployed, and that was in the floods in the Midwest and to Galveston during, uh, following uh, Hurricane Ike. And I do want to point out here that while most of the team members are AIC members, a third of them are allied professionals who bring important skills to collections response efforts. While 2009 was happily a very quiet year for AIC CERT members, FAIC continued to communicate with other responding organizations and began to seek additional funding to train more AIC CERT members, to enhance communication among them, and to provide emergency training to the staffs of um, historic sites. And a second grant from IMLS in 2010 is allowing us to proceed with these plans. Meanwhile, in January of 2010, a year ago yesterday, it's hard to believe, Haiti suffered horrendous devastation from an earthquake. And while human health and saved, safety were the first priority, the cultural community was asking what could be done to save Haiti's significant uh, cultural uh, heritage. It was only when Corey Wegener of the uh, U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield came to us and asked if we could help in Haiti, did we even seriously consider a role there. And it wasn't until uh, we, it wasn't until we really had some pieces in place that we could even seriously consider that. And that was having a partnership with the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield, the Smithsonian Institution, and the Haitian government. The Smithsonian took the lead in making contacts in government and in the arts community, and in providing a secure place for us to work. The Blue Shield, with experience in international response efforts, ensured safe conditions for AIC CERT members and other responders. Critical funding was supplied by NEH, NEA, and IMLS. FAIC's role in Haiti has, bec has become a long-term effort, which is not typical of, of our previous work. And we've learned a great deal from this experience. While we will continue to focus AIC CERT efforts in the United States in the future, we are now participating in discussions to better coordinate international cultural relief efforts, 
in the future and in examining the optimal roles for government agencies versus NGOs. Now, I'm going to backtrack just for a minute again to mention that the very first initiatives of the foundation were conceived to build awareness of conservation. The idea of gathering oral histories from leaders in the field was first conceived in 1974, spearheaded by Joyce Hill Stoner. The project was soon approved by the board for FAIC and Winterthur Museum agreed to provide housing for the archive. The oral history project continues as a partnership today, still under Joyce's leadership. And this year, our goal is to begin to take selected, annotated transcriptions and post them on COOL. <clears throat> Gradually, more of these oral histories will be made available for research and study into the history of conservation in America. I was also intrigued by another early initiative, and one began, that began in 1976. Louis Pomerantz took the lead in developing an exhibition that was circulated nationally, nationally by the Smithsonian Sites um, Program. And it ran from 1976 to 83. It was in great demand. The exhibition, Know What You See, used photographs to show analytical techniques and the results of cleaning and treatments. In the exhibition brochure, Mr. Pomerantz addressed concerns sometimes still expressed by conservators today about revealing conservation techniques to the public. He asked, but will our ideals be further advanced by maintaining walls of silence and islands of ignorance, or by building bridges and sharing knowledge. While FAIC no longer produces exhibitions, similar outreach continues with the use of videos, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, our wiki programs, and other internet tools that have a longer life and are generally less expensive to produce and maintain than traveling exhibitions. And today we have just so many more ways to build bridges and share knowledge than we did in 1970s. As I begin to wrap up this presentation, I'd just like to add a few observations that I find hopeful as we begin to look at what the uh, future might bring. The use of technology is exposing the work of conservators in, in ways that are, were unimaginable when FAIC was born. More videos of treatments, emergency responses, and collaborative projects are, that are viewed on the internet net the more people will be intrigued to learn more about conservation. I already see an increase and have over recent years in attention from the media and more knowledgeable and in-depth stories taking place, being written. Um, and we can build on this interest in behind the scenes work, um, the idea of the conservator as both doctor and detective, and we can better make our case for the support of the preservation of our cultural heritage. Collaborative initiatives are certainly not new, but there seem to be many more international, important international projects um, than in the past, and more uh, collaborative research projects into new media and materials. New technology is driving collaborative efforts, um, ones that will evolve as new skills are needed and additional tools and technologies are created. And there's a generational shift underway that bodes well for the profession. Emerging leaders in the field have different expectation, expectations and needs. There's an energy, of course, along with the expectation of collaborative work environments and a broad sharing of expertise and information that's essential to um, as the working environment changes. In conclusion, I will just reiterate a theme that surfaced repeatedly throughout this presentation. The foundation is only as strong as the people with whom we collaborate. We have limited resources, we all do, but the expertise and generosity of our board, staff, AIC members, along with all our many, many colleagues, make our successes possible. It's certainly a treat for me uh, to be working with such an amazing group of people and each of us doing our own part. It is, it's when the challenges and when the statistics become overwhelming that I remind myself of all the remarkable work that's being done. One conservator at a time, one institution, one organization at a time. I've only been able to touch on a very few examples today, but by linking the knowledge gained by each project and each discovery, by sustained efforts in communications um, to, com to communicate this knowledge and provide linkings, FAIC can truly make a difference in raising awareness and appreciation of the preservation of our cultural heritage. 
And with that, I'm going to stop and see if there's any questions or comments. Thank you. Yes, sorry. Yes, um, AAOC has been very effective in um, defining ethics in terms of um, technical, professional, commercial best practices. I think less so in terms of the theoretical aspects. And what I mean by that is a foundation for not only how we go about preservation, but why we go about preservation. And this may seem self-evident. Certainly most of the people we work with and speak with, the, it, it's transparent. You know, there's no question why we should preserve this. But especially if we've had the, the luxury and the privilege, many of us, of developing our careers in relatively you know, good economic I think that will be absolutely essential, and I think that there's a lot of um, talk about that type of thing uh, by the board already, by the um, both FAIC and AIC boards. Um, and I'm hoping to um, the upcoming annual meeting, um, talking about you know ethics, uh, and and uh, we'll bring a lot of those discussions to the fore where we can begin to craft some language that will be helpful. Yes, very good point. Anyone else? No? All right, thank you. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful, Earl. Thank you so very much. And I want to um, express to our indebtedness to FAIC for the support that they've given us for programs that we've done jointly with you. I think maybe one of the first programs that Eric did when he came on board was with the Library of Congress, and we're very appreciative of that and look forward to doing more. So if there are no other questions, then we hope you all come back to our next uh, series next week when we'll have um, Don Waters from the Mellon speaking to us. And I wish you a good day. Thanks again very much for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.